بنویسید Well, good morning. Uh, before we open up Psalm 46, does anyone have Psalm 26, verse 3 memorized? It's kind of our theme verse for the summer. And if you can recite it to me either now or later, uh, you can choose one of these three Crossway classics. We gave them all the way last week, so you guys are eager to hide God's word within your heart. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding his way according to to your word. And these are wonderful, wonderful truths that we would do well to invest our time and memory into. Anyone want to give it a go? Psalm 26.3 in any translation, you have the life of God and the soul of man. Google. This is more of a sermon. Uh, the expulsive power of a new affection. Uh, and then, of course, for our Packer lovers, what did the cross achieve? Anyone want to go for it? Uh -uh. Okay. Well, they will stay up here to tantalize you. Another quick announcement. It is so good to have Brother Cliff with us this morning, uh, right behind me with that wonderful, loud singing voice. Uh, with him is a dear brother uh, who's living in Arkansas, uh, Conway, Arkansas. He's actually doing uh, an internship. Uh, the pastor is Jeff Johnson. You might recognize that name for those of you uh, who chose to work through the study on the church in your grace groups. That's the Jeff Johnson. Um, his, his name is Cole and make him feel welcome after the service. Introduce yourself. And uh, my guess is he'll be joining uh, Cliff for the service this uh, afternoon in Tabor. And he's staying till Tuesday? Tuesday. So uh, welcome, Brother Cole. I pray the Holy Spirit will minister to you. And uh, this wonderful love that Christ gives to all his people, this wonderful unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, this mutual indwelling uh, of of Christ via the Holy Spirit. It's a wonderful blessing when you can see a brother from down south and realize we have everything in common. Well, with that introduction, please open up your copy of God's Word to Psalm 46. We worked through Psalm 45 last week, and so my math, which isn't the greatest, would still lead us to Psalm 46. And when you found it, please, out of respect and reverence for God's Word, which reveals God's person and work in Christ God's Son. Let's stand it and let us hear it together. Hear now the word of God. To the choir master, a psalm of the sons of Korah, according to Alamoth, a song. God is to us a refuge and a strength, a very present help in time of troubles. Therefore, we will not fear when the earth gives way, when the mountains tumble into the heart of the sea, when its waters roar, when they foam, when the mountains tremble at its swelling. Selah. A river, its streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitations of the Most High. God is in her midst. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations roar. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord. How he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress, Selah. Well, this is the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Father, what a feast you have spread before us this morning. 
in the word preached, and in the word tasted. And we would ask, even this morning, O oh, triune God, that you would be pleased for our great pleasure to reveal yourself to us in the Son. Lord, there are many in this room, Lord, who are going through trials. It feels like their feet are slipping. It feels like the very pillars and foundations of the world are reeking and rocking. Oh, Father, I pray that you would give them a word of assurance, a word of comfort, that you would supernaturally, by the ministry and power of the Holy Spirit, enable them to fix their gaze upon Christ, this beautiful bridegroom of Psalm 45 who has won for himself a bride, but who is now preparing for her a dwelling place, who will return as we just sang when that trumpet, that war trumpet sounds, and he will come and rescue his bride from this wicked world that is opposed to her and her husband. In the twinkling of an eye, he will rescue her. And so, Father, would you help us by faith to look to that day, to long for it, to hasten it. And Father, I pray, and though we have not seen this beloved one of Psalm 45, we would believe and love him. And I pray, Lord, that we would yearn and long for his sure return. I pray, Holy Spirit, that in these trials, we would groan and say, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Come for your bride. But until then, add to her number. Save your elect. As Pastor Nathan remind us, add to this living temple, living stones. Oh, Lord, even do so this morning. Father, Son, and Spirit, you who alone know the heart and circumstances of everyone in this room, please comfort us with that. Or for those, Lord, who do not know Christ, who have not bowed their knee to him, would that terrify them? Would that chase them to the cross? Oh, how comforting it is to know that you, Jesus, knew Nathaniel. And in the twinkling of an eye, you opened those eyes and to see that you were the Son of God, that you were the King of Israel. Would you not do that for us this morning, O oh, enthroned one, O oh, one who rules the nations, O oh, you who is head of the church? Would you not be pleased to pour forth the Holy Spirit, to give faith and repentance, and to give sight and to give ears to grant the new heart, which is essential for us to come to you? Help me now, Lord, to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ, would our hearts want this city, not because of streets of gold or pillars of pearls, but because our beloved bridegroom is there and we shall look upon his face. Oh, Father, help us to, to long for that one. In your presence, fullness of joy by faith. But, oh, Lord, how we long for that day. In your presence, fullness of joy by sight. So, Father, we pray, give us grace to hear now from you and from this sacred word we ask, for Jesus' sake and in his name, amen. Please be seated. Well, as we were reminded last week, the Psalms, all five books, and even within each of those books, there is a theme, a progression, a movement. And we saw last week that all of humanity, redeemed and unredeemed, is longing for a wedding. And I would build off of that, and I would say that all of humanity, redeemed and unredeemed, is longing for paradise. And the reason that is so is because we go all the way back to Genesis 1 and 2, and we were reminded that the Bible both begins and ends with a wedding in the presence of God. That there was a, an untainted, untarnished, good, very good creation where God and his people dwelt together in wonderful and mutual harmony. And we saw, unfortunately, that because of Adam and Eve's treacherous rebellion, that something was broken. We call that the fall. And yet, within the hearts of all people, whether you're a Christian here this morning or not, there is a yearning within you for things to be made right. Now, of course, we have a corrupted, broken, twisted 
depraved understanding often of what paradise might be. But there is still that longing, and I am praying, and I hope you are praying, that we will see that all of those longings are satisfied and fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to close, I hope, seeing that in the final two chapters of the Bible, Revelations 21 and 22. And for you who are groaning this morning, oh, I pray that a fresh sight, a fresh vision, as it were, uh, of that momentous day when Christ returns for his bride and ushers in the age of ages and we live forever in his presence in that untarnished, unvarnished, sinless creation, your heart will long for it. And that's what the psalmist is giving for us this morning in Psalm 46. It's a, it's a treasure for the people of God. For those of you who are familiar with Luther's classic, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, it was inspired from this psalm. And I pray that whether all of it or even parts of it, you would commit to memory. By God's grace, many, many, many moons ago, I memorized this, and it has been for me a refuge. It has been for me a high place. And not uh, as the pagans would worship on the high place, but a high place, a strong tower where the righteous can run into it and find safety. Well, that's enough of me. Let's get to the text. To the choir master. This is for the people of God. It is for me on a Monday morning when I'm going through the pastoral blues. But first and foremost, David, who is the sweet psalmist of Israel, who organized worship for the people of God after the temple would be built in the city of God. He was giving instruction in Chronicles to the Levites, of whom included choir masters, the worship leader, if you will. And he is giving instructions. And we saw in the previous Psalms that there was wisdom to be had in these Psalms. Well, here, there is confidence to be gained in the psalm as well. To the choir master. This is for the people of God. It's for, I would translate that, the sons of Korah. The same ones of Psalms 42 and 43. The same ones of Psalms 44 and 45. How are you to lead the people of God in worship? Remind them with this song that the king is coming. And he has a city of refuge for his weary, beleaguered saints. That's true for us this morning. Though maybe not quoted in the New Testament, as was Psalm 45, this psalm finds its true and sure fulfillment in Christ and the new heavens and the new earth. And I pray that we will see that this morning. It's according to Alamot, a song. There's various uh, understandings of what it means some people think it means for the young virgins, and so maybe set to a higher pitch or a higher key. I'm not sure exactly what it means. I do know that if you read it in Hebrew, it picks up on a prevalent theme, the Hebrew word mot, which can be translated either death, not here, or shaking, and reeling, rocking. And so I think that perhaps you could say that this is a song to be sung gladly in a high pitch when the world is rocking and reeling. There are plays on words in Hebrew that we don't get in English. And it's a song. It's not an essay. It's not for scholars to ponder over. It's for saints gathered together to sing. When the world all around you gives way, oh, that God would put a song in your heart. It's wonderful providence that Psalm 40 was read as our call to worship. And what does God do? He pulls his people out of a, a miry pit, out of the miry bog, and he sets their feet on a solid ground that cannot be shaken. And he puts what into their mouth, into their heart? A new song, a song of praise. And I pray that we would sing this, or whether singing a mighty fortress is our God or singing this, or that the Spirit would well up within us a song of confidence. The song is neatly broken up into, I would believe, three sections. The word Selah has not been added by the ESV translation committee. It is in the Hebrew. And most scholars, or at least a majority of them, would think that this is perhaps a time for reflection or pause. And I'm going to hold to that because I really don't know. I've read too much and no one can say with certainty. But I would hold with the, the common understanding that Selah is a time for reflection, for meditation, for pause. And so you can see that with the, um, the superscription into verse 3 is the first section, and it ends with Selah, pause. And then we have verses 4 through 7, 
with a pause. And then, of course, it closes with verses 8 through 11 and a pause. And that's good. Spurgeon says there are certain times in life when it is right to pause. And we would do well after each of the points to pause. And I would encourage us as we providentially are taking the Lord's table that there would be a pause for reflection. Not merely about how our world might seem out of control or how we have sinned against a holy God, but for pause and reflection that God for his people is a refuge and he is a strength for them, that he is a strong tower. He is a impenetrable fortress. And he has become for us the God of Jacob in Christ. Well, I have three points for us this morning, and they all are founded upon this foundation of God's person and promises. And so when you're reading the word of God, always be asking yourself, what is this showing me of who God is? What is this teaching me about God's character, about his person? But also, what is this teaching me about his promises? His precious and very sweet promises. Not merely, what does this mean to me? Or how can I just read it as fast as I can to get on with my day? But what is God communicating to me about his person and his promises? And I would say in light of the truths of God's person and promises as revealed in this psalm, his people are encouraged to have three things. First, peace in the chaos, verses 1 through 3. Second, joy in the crisis, verses four through seven. And then lastly, confidence in the conqueror. Okay, I I hope that'll help you, whether you're an alliterative person or not. I want us to have peace in the chaos and I want us to have joy in the crisis and I want us to have confidence in the conqueror. So first, peace in the chaos. It begins simply this way, God, Elohim. And it could have started with the covenant name, but often we're just uh, drawn here, as Alan Ross would say, uh, to God's power. That he is mighty, that he is strong. And you need to know that, especially when you're in trials or when it feels like all the world is giving way underneath of you. God. And I do want to pause here because the next word in Hebrew is very important for us. If you were looking at this, in each of the three points, this word lanu, for us, is used. And the reason I say that is because God is not a refuge and strength for everyone. He is a refuge and strength for us. And the for us are the covenant people of God. And I would say for us in the New Testament, those who are in Christ, God is your refuge and strength. And by the time we get to the end, there is an invitation, an exhortation. I want you to to look on the day of days when Christ returns to save his bride and destroy his enemies. Can you say God is my God? He is my fortress. He is my strength. He is my refuge. God is for us. And the choir master is encouraging the congregation and pastors should remind the flock, though the world might be against us, mocking, reviling, persecuting, hindering, killing, God is for us. Refuge and strength. And it does, I think, I don't know if Paul's picking up on this in Romans chapter 8, but if God is for us, who can be against us? It's interesting because there's another emphasis in this. God is with us. And that is important. But the first thing that the inspired poet writes is God is for us. Is God for you? If God be for you, who is against you? Or as ESV would say, who can be against you? Answer, no one. Nothing. Nothing. Not a trial, not the future, not the past, not the present, not things seen, not things unseen, not even hell or death itself can be against you, but you must be in Christ. And so I would plead with you already, we don't don't save our altar calls for the end of the service. I would plead with you right now that if you do not belong to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, 
that you would call upon him, that you would run to him right now. All that come to me, says the Savior, I will in no wise cast out. And we run to him for refuge. We run to him for safety. And if you run to him, he will become to you your refuge. And maybe for the first time ever, you can quote this psalm from a regenerated, sincere heart. God is my refuge. He is my strength. And I always say it, so I'll say it again. It's the story of John Wesley. And uh, he, he, he was, he was uh, on a ship, and it was rocking and reeling, and he probably felt like the psalmist of Psalm 46. And he was freaking out. And some brethren came along, and they said, you can trust the Lord. He is the Savior of the world. And he says, I know that he's the Savior of the world. And he says, but he's your Savior. And it makes all the difference of the world. Children, you know Jesus is the Savior of the world, and that's good. But is he your Savior? Parents, never, for, never, ever, ever stop reminding them that they must be saved. That he's not, not our refuge and strength by birth, but by rebirth. Wonderful Hebrew word, refuge. God, this mighty one, for us, is a refuge. It's the picture, if you were to look in other passages, it's used in parallelism with a shelter. He's a shelter in the time of storm. And, and, and a refuge might not mean anything to you unless you are fleeing from something that threatens to destroy you or undo you. And you might not sense it, but there is a foe who is threatening to destroy and undo you. And whether you realize it or not, you might be living in, uh, in a time of ease and comfort right now saying, I need no refuge, it's sunny skies. But with the eye of faith, you need to understand that there is a adversary roaring, seeking someone to devour. And you need this morning more than anything, a refuge, not merely from your trials, but you need a refuge from the wrath of God. And I'm gonna try to prove that from this Psalm. I think that is the ultimate picture of what we need to find refuge from. Yes, find refuge in your trials today, of course. But this apocalyptic vision in verses one through three is a picture of the end. It is a picture when God comes in wrath, when he undoes his creation in his fury and wrath. And will you have a refuge? For his people, God is a refuge and he is strength. And we know that. He will give you everything you need. He will provide a place of safety. When you're running from the rain, oh, how wonderful it is to find a refuge. I think of The Hobbit. I, I know I don't read the book as much as you, so I don't know if it's in the book, but in the movie, uh, when uh, they're running away from Beor the bear, and you remember, I forget, the super really fat one. I know that's not politically correct to say in 24, but he's Bombor, he's running away, and he runs into the wall. And what they need from this bear is a refuge. And you remember, if you watch the movie, they shut it just in time, and he's pawing through the door, and then they shut it and they lock it. That's the refuge. But you need it for more than just a man changing into a bear. You need it from God's own fury and wrath. And that's what he is. You need to be saved by God from God. That sounds terrifying. But he is a very present help in trouble. You, you might say he can be found exceedingly in troubles. He's not like the, the friend who says, yeah, I'm with you. Uh, it, it, I don't know why. I haven't watched it in a while, but then it's also from The Hobbit. And um, uh, Bilbo goes down, and he's going to go try to get the Ark and Stone. If you haven't seen this, please just use your imagination. Pretend you know what I'm talking about. Um, and, and, you know, he's going down there, and he's getting a pep talk. And, and, and there's this, this man-eating dragon who can incinerate his bones. And, and he turns to ask a question, and his friend is gone. God is not like that. And when the troubles get fierce and intense and you, you go to seek him, he's not gone. He's readily available, you could translate that. He is an ever-present help in times, plural of trouble, in every trouble you're going through. And ultimately, on the day of days when God shakes and sifts the world in judgment, he will be there and he will be your refuge and strength. He is very present. That's a good translation. Not just present, but exceedingly, abundantly, overwhelmingly present. And you might feel that God has forsaken you. 
but he has not. He is very present in your trials. He is very present in your troubles. Look at the logic. This is why you need doctrine. This is why you read the Bible and say, who is God? What does this teach me about God? Not what do I feel about God. He doesn't feel strong for me today. He doesn't feel like a refuge. He doesn't feel near me. But doctrine says he is all of those things and more. He is that shelter. He is that refuge. He is that strength. He is that power. He is that presence. He is that friend that sticks closer than a brother. What is desired in a man is steadfast love and loyalty. He is infinitely loyal. How can I prove that to you? The cross. Emmanuel. God with us. He did not leave us in the hour of trial or trouble. But he drank the cup and went all the way to the cross. You can have peace in chaos. Why? Because God for you in Christ is a refuge and a strength, and he is a very present help in trouble. You can have peace in that. When you find refuge, the storm doesn't stop. You can still see it. But he provides for you that refuge. Therefore, or upon this, you could literally translate it. Here's logic. Because of A, therefore B. If he is a refuge and a strength, if he is a present help in trouble, therefore, conclusion, deduction, I ought not fear. So f- perhaps you find yourself fearing the, the trial you're in. Maybe you don't know how you will make the bill payment. Maybe you fear death itself. I don't know what you fear. But rather than focusing on the fear, focus on who God is and the promises he has made. Meditate. Blessed is the man who does what? He meditates in the law day and night. He reminds himself of who God is and what he has promised. Therefore, we will not fear. We often say, therefore, I will not fear. But this is the necessity of gathering together. Choir master, teach the people of God. Come alongside. We will not fear. The SV translates it, though. You may have noticed I translated it, when. One, I think the Hebrew says that. And two, I think that the psalmist is arguing from the greater to the lesser. That if you can find refuge in God on the day of judgment, and he will be there for you, a tower of refuge and strength, he will not abandon you in the day of judgment, how much more will he be with you in the trial you're going through? Does that make sense? Right? If I give you a million dollars on Monday, you can have confidence I'll give you a 10 on Tuesday. And I think that's the argument here. I'm not going to fear when God comes and he undoes creation and judgment. This is language used in Genesis 1 and 2, and it's used in Genesis 6 through 9. When God shakes the world and he floods it because of sin, nevertheless, he was with his people few they may be. He was with them. That ark, that place of safety, that ark was a refuge. God was present with Noah and the eight. Even though the rains were were flooding and the world was tottering, he was with them. And he will be with you, dear saint, on that day if you're in Christ. Why? Because he's made a promise to never leave or forsake his people. He is for you, and he is with you. And so you can have peace in the chaos. Look at the chaos. Though the earth gives way. This is this word moat, right? Remember I said alamot, right? This is one of the three or four times it's used here. And it it, it pictures shaking and tottering, sort of like Hebrews 12. When God is going to shake the world, he's going to sieve it. That's what judgment's going to be. He's going to shake the world and only that which has foundations will remain. But if you're in Christ, you have foundations because this foundation in his refuge is sure. When the earth gives way, will you be found in Christ? Or will your refuge be that that, um, little shanty of Matthew 7? That when the, the wind and the waves begin to roar, it will destroy it and great will be its fall. Everyone will find and look for a refuge on that day. Some will ask for rocks and mountains to be thrown upon them. 
but those who know Christ will know that he is their refuge and strength. Therefore, we will not fear. This is preaching to yourself. We saw it in Psalm 42 and 43. Don't let the circumstance preach to you. Preach to your circumstance. This is who God is. And I don't understand what he's doing, but I'm not going to fear. We are not going to fear, though the earth shakes, or I think the LSB says changes. It's a picture of it being undone. When the mountains are tumbled into the heart of the sea, right? If you're not afraid of that, then you can face tomorrow. When its waters rage or roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, you can have peace in that. In the language of chaos, you can have peace because God is for his people. Secondly, you can have joy in your crisis. But before we get there, don't forget the Selah. You need to believe this. It's one thing for the pastor to wave his hands and raise his voice. Do you believe this? And if not, ask with the man who, whose son had epileptic seizures, Lord, I believe. Help mine unbelief. You don't feel like a refuge to me. You don't feel like the strong one for me. I've run to you for refuge, but it seems like the storm is still beating against me. And the reason why I think it's important that I preach to you that, that this is the ultimate shaking of the nations because I'm a very cynical person, but you might say, well, God is a refuge and a strength, a very present help in time of trouble. And I prayed, and my dad still died. I prayed, and I didn't get the job I wanted. I prayed, and I'm still single. He's no refuge. This is the Christians using flowery talk. It doesn't, it, it, it doesn't comport with, with my reality. Oh, no, it does. And you have to understand that this is the ultimate refuge. God does not promise to spare you from calamity or hardships or trials or storms. He doesn't say, well, when you come to me, I'll stop shaking the very ground you're walking upon. He doesn't promise that, but he does promise this, that he'll be with you through it. And he promised you a day is coming when Jesus will return and he will set up a new heavens and a new earth where there'll be no more rocking and reeling, no more undoing of creation, no more troubles, no more fears, no more anxieties. He promises that he will be with you through that for sure and that you will find refuge and so in light of that, with the eye of faith, dim though it may be, God offers you peace in the chaos. Are you going through chaos this morning? Oh, that you would remember who God is and what he has promised and how Jesus Christ is the yes and the amen to all of that. Now, let me get to the gospel quickly. God has already begun to undo creation somewhere in the gospel accounts. Language like this is used, actually, in end-time apocalyptic literature, and not just when Jesus returns. But do you remember what happened when Jesus was on the cross? It became dark. It was like the, the, the sun and the moon went out. And so I would translate, when the stars are falling, I don't take that literally. I take that the way an Old Testament Jew would, that it is a sign of God undoing his good creation in judgment. And the reason why you won't have to experience that violent shaking and the stars falling and the sky going black is because Christ did that for you on the cross. Go and read that. Go and read it in Mark's account. I read in a wonderful book 15 years ago, The Cross from a Distance by Peter Bolt. You can't borrow it from me, but you can buy it and read it. And he is showing that all of this language that we always think, you know, it's going to be in the newspapers and it's always the end time, the end time, the end time. He says it happened already on the cross and it is a precursor to the day of days when Jesus returns. God will shake everyone. Either he shakes you in Christ and you pass through the judgment or if you're outside of Christ, you fall into the hands of a living God. That's terrifying. If you're in Christ, you can have peace in the chaos because he was undone. 
the Son of God, the creator of all things, the incarnate word was undone in judgment. And if you're in him, you can pass safely through judgment because he bore it for you. Second, you can have joy in the crisis. So he moves from this picture of, of cosmic upheaval and to perhaps uh, something a little more practical or, or at least in their own experience in verses four through seven. Though all this is happening, God is a refuge. And he moves from this, this comforting word of refuge into a comforting image of river. You might have noticed again when I read it, I didn't write, I didn't read, there is. That's not in the Hebrew. And so some translators, and I agree with them, they translated a river exclamation point. So everything's rocking and reeling, right? This is the picture you see. Everything is going crazy. What in the world's happening? And then there's a river, right? And it's like that hymn we sing, when peace like a river attendeth my way, right? So all, all hell is being unleashed, as it were, or all of God's fierce wrath and fury. And then he looks, he switches, he switches his gaze, right? He sees this, and all of a sudden, I was like, what? Something caught the corner of my eye. Oh, wait, there's a river. And that's how I translate it. When, when, when all of creation is being undone, a river! And its streams make glad the city of God. And some scholars think that this is perhaps uh, thinking about what we read in Isaiah when we work through that Old Testament, right? In Isaiah 37, 38, 39, when, when King Sennacherib of Assyria, when he, when he was trash-talking Hezekiah, and it was, almost like, uh, it was almost like they were surrounding the city of Jerusalem and pounding on its gates and threatening it and seeking to undo the city of God. And Hezekiah... He focuses attention on water, on an aqueduct. And what the author here is saying, that there's a river for the people of God. Now, the reason why, again, don't take this literally, is because if you were to study the city of Jerusalem, there's no river going through Jerusalem. So what kind of river is God offering? He's offering that in the chaos of trials, he offers the joy of life. Can you think of another place where a river would give life to the people of God, the inhabitants of God's holy dwelling place? Well, it starts in Genesis. You need to read your Bibles canonically that there's a wedding in the beginning, that there's a dwelling of God with his people in the beginning, and there's a life-giving river in the beginning. And interestingly enough, all those things are found in the book of Revelation. In the New Jerusalem, if you've ever read it, there is a river that divides the city in two. And it gives life to the tree of life that we may eat of the fruit of and partake. And so what God is doing here is he's reminding his people that even in the chaos, he might not provide for them a, a, a physical river, as important as that may be in a physical battle. I would say for you that even in your spiritual trial, there is a spiritual life-giving source of life, a river. And it makes glad the city of God. That's wonderful. It doesn't say the river gets rid of the trial, but by faith, that river gives life. Jesus talked about it to the woman at the well. She was going to the well for water. He says, ah, if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask of me, and I would give you life-giving water. What kind of water? It's this kind of stream that makes glad the city of God, which is not Dan or Bethel or some of these other scholars, it is Jerusalem, spiritual Jerusalem. It's the holy habitation of El Yon, of the Most High. Why can you have joy in your crisis? Look at verse 5. Because God is in the midst of her. Isn't that wonderful? Sometimes our children can get afraid, and then all of a sudden, Daddy grabs the hand okay, it's all right now, dad's here. And I don't want to be irreverent, but in, in a much more glorious way, even though there's trial going on, and God is in her midst. And then go back to now Sennacherib, right? It's 701 BC, and they're building their ramparts, and they're sharpening their arrows, and they're sounding their trumpets, and the people within are freaking out. But they know that the king is within her. And this king is not any old king, he's Elion, 
El Elyon, God Most High. And we're going to see that El Elyon is also Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of armies, the Lord of heaven's armies, the Lord who is a warrior. And so this is this, this calming river. I don't know if you've, if you've ever gone beside a, 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 a still waters, like Psalm 23 says, but there's something peaceful. And it makes glad the city of God. Now, I, I'm not going to go there because I went way too long last week and I'm going way too long this week. Right in your notes, Isaiah chapter 8. Some of you know sometimes I have a nickname for Shiloh and sometimes you're like, why does he call her Shiloh? Maybe you haven't, but now you will when you hear me call her that. It's because it comes from this, this Hebrew word shalom. You, you remember in the New Testament, the waters of Siloam? Well, in Hebrew, the s and sh are the same letter, sin, sheen. And so here we have here in Isaiah 8, where, where you've got these, 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 these forces that are opposing King Ahaz. And God offers them the rivers of Shiloh to drink. Unfortunately, they refuse them. And the waters that offer peace or shalom become for them waters of destruction. And so what is God saying to us this morning? That even though the city of God is perhaps surrounded, there can be a gladness because God in his presence offers this life-giving water. And I would say for us in the new covenant that is most fully fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. God is in her midst. She shall not be moved. So, so look at verse 2. So I'm a, I'm a circler. I'm a line drawer. Right, it says, Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way. That's the same Hebrew word moat as the word here, she shall not be moat. She shall not be moved. So, so that's what the psalmist wants. The earth can be moved, but if you're in Christ, you will not be. That's powerful. God's in her midst. She shall not be moved. The mountains can shake. The earth can be changed or moved. How strong must he be then? If, if you're in Christ, the only way you can be moved is if he is moved. Does that make sense? Like if I'm holding on to my girls, the only way that they can be moved is if somebody causes me to rock and to reel. Can God be moved? No. And therefore, those who are in him or who have taken refuge in his strong city in which he dwells in the midst of, they shall not be moved. To which you say, but I'm still going through trials. Again, I would say, God doesn't promise that he will spare you from those trials, but when it comes to the day of days, you will not be moved on the day of judgment. God is in her midst. She shall not be moved. God will help her. Remember in verse 1, he's a very present help. And what does help mean? It means doing something that we cannot do for ourselves. God will do what we cannot do for ourselves. I can't stop myself from shaking or being moved. I cannot stop myself from fearing. But a helper can come alongside and he can give me what I need. He can give me what I cannot give myself. And this is important. When will he help her? You're like, please let it be today. Please, please, pastor, say, I'm, I, I'm sick of this trial. Please give me a promise that, that he will help her in the next minute. I can't. He will help her when what? When morning dawns. That's always a picture of salvation in the Old Testament into the new. Right? The sorrow may last for a night, but what comes in the morning? Joy. You're like, I've been suffering for more than a night. To which you would say, you don't read the Bible always so hyper-literally like that. The picture of darkness. We live in a dark world. The light of the world has come in. And God promises this. He will help you in morning dawns. When Jesus Christ returns, he will be your helper. He will be your present help in time of need. Well, the nations, they're roaring like the seas that are threatening the city of God, the nations in this crisis. They're threatening the city of God, the people of God. The kingdoms are tottering. What does he do? How does he offer her comfort? He says, here's a refuge. Here's a river. Here's a word. You catch that? What does he do? The nations are raging. The kingdoms are tottering. What does he do? He utters his voice. The voice that gives comfort to his people and the voice that destroys the earth 
and his enemies. He utters, literally, he gives his voice. Everyone loves Nathan's name. You know what it means in Hebrew? Natan? It means to give. It's a word of grace. So he doesn't utter his voice, he gives his voice. What do you need this morning? You need his voice. You need a word. And I pray that he would utter his voice and that he would comfort you. And the the uttering of his voice here destroys his enemies. It will happen. Verse 7, why can you have joy in your crisis? Because the Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob, for us, a fortress. He is with us, he is for us. You can have peace in the chaos and joy in your crisis because not just any old God is with us, this is the covenantally faithful warrior. And you can think of movies, right? I'm thinking of some right now. I've already given way too many movie illustrations to make you wonder what I do with my time. But just knowing that the warriors here were good. He's got us. Not as he all powerful, he's all faithful. He does not speak out of both sides of his mouth. When we need him, he doesn't abandon us. He is right there with us. And he is Jehovah Sabaoth. You ever wonder what that, you know, when we're singing a mighty fortress is our God? Right? Lord Sabaoth. What does that mean? It means the Lord who is a warrior. Hosts, armies, mighty ones. If you have the NLT, He's the Lord of heaven's armies, and he's dispatching them. There's only one reason why you will ever persevere. Because the Lord of heaven's army dispatches all the agents necessary to preserve his elect. And you will make it safely home. Because the Lord of armies is with you. Or better, he is with us. How do I know the church will grow? How do I know? No, you know, we sing the church is one foundation. There's enemies without, there's enemies within. How do I know that she will prevail and conquer? Because the Lord of hosts is with her. He is with us. The covenantally faithful God of Jacob is our fortress. And I quickly just want to emphasize the importance of the word Jacob. Nathan actually providentially brought it up. Jacob was a schemer, but God humbled him. He struck his hip. And when you read after that, that Jacob is often then characterized not by uh, being a deceiver, but by being a needy, weak saint. And so you might feel like Jacob at times. You might think, oh, Laban's going to get me. Oh, Esau's going to destroy me. I have nothing. I walk with a limp. My life is a mess. But God was faithful to him. As he was faithful to Abraham, Isaac, he was faithful to this weakened believer named Jacob. And what Jacob needs more than anything else is not a pep talk. He needs a fortress. The Hebrew is a wonderful, it's a high place. It'd be like the highest mountain where no one can even get at you. And that's what the God of Jacob is for his bride. To again, what you ask, why am I still going through trials? Because God wants you to experience just how great a refuge he is. We're like, it'd be awesome if you were a refuge. And so when I like just nick my finger, I could run to you and you'll heal it and it's good. But then you would never really know the depths of his refugehood. I know that's just made up. But that's what God is doing. Some of you are wondering, like, why didn't he answer? Why, Why are we going through this? Because he is actually taking you deeper and deeper into his refuge. He's showing you some of those rooms which other saints don't get to see or experience. And why he does for some and not for others, I don't know. But his refuge is wonderful. And some of you are going through hell on earth. And God is proving to you that he is your refuge in the storm. Some storms are more violent. Well, he takes you deeper and deeper into that impenetrable fortress. So you can have peace. You can have joy in the chaos and the crises. Because you need to say this. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is for us. What? What? He is for us a fortress. a fortress. And lastly, you can have confidence in the conqueror. Verses 8 through 11. I didn't pause much for Selah. That can be your Lord's Day afternoon. Come. Come, children. I, I want to teach you. Remember, David is teaching the choir master and the sons of Korah. How do you lead weary, beleaguered saints? You remind them of who God is, and then you tell them to live in light of that. Come. 
I got a flanograph for you. I got, I got something for you to see. Behold, it's just, it's not, it's a good word, but it's not the usual Hebrew word. You remember way back, we went through the book of Micah. And Micah was given a vision, a prophetic vision. It's the same Hebrew word. Have you ever heard the word chaza? Chaza! Me, I have. That's what the word behold is. And so God is giving a prophetic vision of the end. We already saw last week that this conquering king is sharpening his arrows and they find their mark. They don't miss. They hit the hearts of his enemies. And at his feet lay slain a multitude of hosts. He wants you to see that, but he here wants you to behold the works of the Lord. He, he, he's trying to scare unbelievers to run to Christ and he's trying to remind believers that he is strong so they will run to him. So whether you're an unbeliever or a believer this morning, the purpose here is to encourage you to flee for refuge to Christ. Come, I want to show you something. You see that army all strewn with dead bodies? That's what happens to God's enemies. When he says, come behold the works of the Lord, I'm not thinking, oh, look, there's a mountain or there's a nice tree. Look at creation. No, this is Hebrew parallelism. The works of the Lord, desolations. Destruction. Cataclysmic destruction. He has brought. It's a prophetic perfect. Meaning what? This is what it will be on the day of days when Jesus returns. His works will be those of desolation to his enemies. So why are you so afraid of them? Stop fearing and regarding man in whose nostrils his breath. Don't put your hope in men. Don't find refuge in alliances, Ahaz. Don't make your RRSP your refuge. Don't make anything but the living Christ your refuge because he's going to destroy everything else. When he shakes it, he's going to shake it good, and only that that has everlasting foundations will remain. He has, or you could say he will, most certainly will bring desolations on the earth. He will make wars to cease to the end of the earth. You're longing for that. I am. He will break the bow and he will shatter the spear He's going to burn the chariots with fire. And all the verbs there show that he's going to do so completely. Like when he breaks the spear, he doesn't just snap it in half. He keeps snapping it in half until it's just a a, a whole bunch of pieces of, of tinder. The saints are to have confidence that the conqueror is coming and he will be victorious. And so you might think, what in the world is going on? Why does it seem like evil still getting its way? Why are all these woke people running the schools and why are they just infiltrating the government and why all this nonsense? Why all the un- unnecessary wars? Why, why, why? It will come to an end. He's going to destroy all that because in his holy city there will be only peace and joy and trust. So memorize verse 10. Wonderfully, I was talking with Emma and what scriptures are encouraging you? And she quoted this one, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I hope to be exalted in the earth. No, those are future, those, he will be. And so he's saying, be still. That's for the believer who's tempted to freak out. Be still. The, the world is shaking. These are the birth pangs Jesus talked about before the end comes. There's wars and rumors of war. And those those won't be removed until King Jesus returns. But be still. It's the same picture of of the people of, of, of Israel when Pharaoh and the mightiest army on earth was closing in on them and their chariots. And behind them is the Red Sea. And Moses cries out. And what does God say? Be still. Watch what I'm gonna do. Right? You can feel. You can feel the ground trembling with all the the horse hooves and chariots rolling in. He says, be still. How can you be still? Because you know something. Be still and know that I am God. And this word yada isn't just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. My dad keeps talking about, oh, pastor's always talking about God's sovereign. You need to be convinced. You need to know at a heart level. One of the footnotes and one of the commentaries I read 
I said that here, it's to acknowledge and embrace and to cherish his sovereignty. Be still and know that God is sovereign. He is going to do this. He's not doing it now, but he will as sure as day. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. This is not up for negotiation. Now, I said be still is for the Christian. If you're reading another translation, most translations say be still. But if you have, say, the New American, or say you have the LSB or another, it will say cease striving. Who's that for? Well, I believe this is a double command, one for believers. Be still to the enemies. Cease striving. I would translate it this way. Stop with an exclamation mark. Believer, stop fretting. Unbeliever, stop warring. God is going to be exalted. That should give the believer great confidence. God is going to be exalted. That should give the unbeliever great fear. And it closes, as did the second point, with this wonderful reminder. As Nathan even said in John 1, in Hebrew, when you repeat something, it's for emphasis. And he leaves us on this high note. The Lord of heaven's armies, the Lord who is a warrior, the Lord of hosts, he is with us. The God of Jacob for us is a fortress. Selah. Let's pray and we'll partake of the table. I think there's a lot of application, which I don't have time to give, for the table. But within this fortress, within this refuge, within this safe space, everyone needs a safe space. You need the ultimate safe space. Not from some conservative. You need a safe space from the wrath of God. But what does he give? His, his, his vittles, the food? This is the, this is the food he gives in that refuge. And so you might not feel like God is your refuge, Christian, but as you partake of the bread and of the cup, you remember that he is. And you remember that he is bringing that city you're longing for. Let me read a couple verses. I pulled a fast one on you. I don't do this that often, Cole. So we read this last week, and and look at the link between bride and city. So 45 into 46. Then I saw a new heaven. This This is a prophetic vision. Behold, John says, a new heaven and a new earth for which the first heaven and the first first earth had passed away and the sea was no more and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And this is what I literally wanted to close with. It's Revelation 22. You can read all of it after. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God, the God who is a refuge, the God who is a a fortress, the God who is a strength, the God who is a warrior, the God who is for us, the God who is with us. From the throne of this God and the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. This is what you're longing for, for the wedding. But dear saint, you're longing for this city. And just the shaking of this world, I hope, is driving you. Just like contractions, when a woman is giving birth, yes, a woman is giving birth, it's, it's, it's moving Right? As painful as it is, it's, it's moving that baby to where it needs to be. And God uses trials to move our hearts to where they need to be on that wedding and in that city. No longer will there be anything accursed. Oh, I long for that. I hate politics. I'm obsessed with them, but I hate them. I'm tired of the garbage. One day, Ryan, there will no longer be anything accursed. No laws, no bills, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. And his servants will worship him. They will sing to him. They will see his face. We will see the king. And his name will be on their foreheads. That will be your passport. Don't take that literally, please. And night will be no more. Remember? When will God help? When the dawn breaks. The night will be no more when Jesus returns. 
We will no longer need light or lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. What a glorious truth. As you partake of the table, remember that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Would you give us grace to meditate on it day and night, that we would be like a transplanted tree by water, streams of living water. And in our trials, would we bear fruit to the glory of God? Father, for those who are hurting, would you help them to believe the truths of who you are from Psalm 46? And whether or not you feel like a refuge, or whether or not you feel like a strong warrior, or whether or not you feel like their helper, Holy Spirit, who dwells within us, remind us that you have come in the person of Christ. Our Emmanuel has come and he is coming. And so, O Holy Spirit, remind us that the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is for us, a fortress. Give us faith to believe this. Help us to walk by faith and help us to believe one day we will by sight. Until that day, strengthen your bride Savior elect and glorify your name, Father, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen.